Mr. K, uh, we're back. This is going to be the future of finance. I'm going to allow my panelists 30 seconds each to introduce themselves in the order coming from this side, my right side to the left. So we're going to have introductions in a moment. Uh, I wanted to set the stage as we're talking about the future of finance. We're not talking about the future of crypto. We're not talking about the future of banks, although banks are included or disincluded. So we have to imagine and visualize the future. Uh, my own perspective is this. I had a conversation where if the normal economy crashed today, what would happen to the crypto economy? And our conclusion was that if the economy collapsed, then crypto would collapse because crypto is not a viable alternative. We don't have enough wallets. We don't have enough of a lot of things. But I think we're building towards a future where we will have those things. And I think that that's the future that we want to discuss today. And helping to build this future are my panelists, 30 seconds each, name, organization, and brief introduction. Hi, my name is Justin Chow. Uh, I work for Cumberland, and we are uh, an OTC market maker, one of the largest in the world, um, with a parent company uh, called DRW that has about 900 people um, in its organization. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brad Chun. I'm the founder and chief investment officer of Shuttle. Uh, we're a multi-strategy uh, investment fund consisting of private office, liquid digital currency trading, uh, private equity and venture funds. Um, we primarily focus on uh, emerging technology, blockchain, uh, and infrastructure, financial infrastructure in that space. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex. I'm partner and CFO of Swift Blockchain, a cross-chain custodialized optional uh, transfer, cryptocurrency transfer platform servicing institutions and individuals. Hi, my name is Frans Jalingi. I'm a co-founder and CEO at FirstCoin Capital. Uh, we're ICO advisory service dealing both with security tokens and utility tokens, and we're now merging with Galaxy Digital, which is a New York-based firm led by Mike Novogratz. And uh, Mike Novogratz wants to build together with Galaxy Digital the Goldman Sachs of crypto. So I wanted to start with the hot topic today, which is banks. So I believe that banks are expressing some of the problems that have to do with centralization. And so uh, what I would love to do is get a perspective. So for me, what I'm going to do is start with an extreme position. And I would like to get anyone who feels passionate about that position to retort. So I'm going to take the position that large centralized banks will be eliminated, and they have no future. And so does anyone want to take that on? Uh, anyone want to take a position about uh, you know, the role of banks going forward? Well, I'll take a start at that. I think we already see that banks are uh, strongly looking at blockchain because they really understand and see the disruptive potential that it has. Um, I mean, we've seen them form consortia in, in many different shapes, and some of the consortia have already fallen apart and then come back together again, and, and like there's a lot happening. Uh, so, e exactly. Uh, so, I don't think we need banks. Uh, so, that, that's a sort of an extreme statement. Will we no longer have banks in the future? I think that's a different question. Yeah, so uh, I like that perspective. I want to actually now flip hats and say something else, which is, I think that what banks have built can be used. I think one thing that can be used is that they've built a lot of reach, but I think we can go much further with decentralized currencies to reach more people. I think the other thing that they've built that I think is meaningful is uh, trusted brands. And I think trusted brands are meaningful, especially in the topic of custody. So I think banks may have a role to play, and they may continue to exist. I'd like to take a stab at that. I, I think, f firstly, um, the banks uh, before you know before the internet, uh, having that scale was very important uh, because you could set up branches in different, for example, in the U.S. and different states and around the country. 
Um, but now that we have that internet, the, the ability to marshal resources and control enough resources to set up all those branches is not nearly as significant as it was. And on the second point regarding brand, I think with, with uh, blockchain, we've come to a point where it's not in the US government we trust, it's not in God we trust, it's in math we trust. Uh, and so I think the necessity for brands in, in some situation is, is lessened. I think that's very interesting. Uh, if you look at bank leadership, you know, you can see the difference between Jamie Dimon, who's sort of anti-Bitcoin, and then you see someone like Lloyd Blankfein from Goldman Sachs, who basically said, look, we used to have gold-backed currency, now we have bimetallic currency, and now we have nothing-backed currency, so why don't we have nothing-backed digital currency? I don't see what the problem is, right? So, you know, we have the CEO of Goldman Sachs saying, I don't see what the problem is. With leadership like that, I think banks may continue. I do want to retort against your blockchain comment, but uh, go ahead, uh, Franz. Yeah, I just want to get back to the brand thing. I think we, uh, some of the earlier panels spoke about custody. Custody is a really important item, and I do think that having uh, some of the, the traditional brands pick up custody and uh, put themselves behind that and use their, uh, both their, their balance sheet to, to, to create that trust, I think it's going to be important for, for, uh, you know, for our transition to mainstream. So, Franz, you said that banks were looking at blockchain, right? Here's what I'm going to say is I think they're looking at it very badly. Uh, I even think that the mindset of the word blockchain is a mistake because it ignores consensus and it ignores decentralized incentives. And I think they're willfully blind to the idea of decentralization because it disrupts them. So I do think that uh, despite the fact that banks, banks are looking at blockchain, but it's not going to save them. I mean, what about also the notion Go that ahead, Justin. You know, in today's world, you have, um, you have um, gold instruments, like the futures, for example, that trade, and you have physical gold. You can walk down the street, you can go to a pawn shop, you can buy a gold bar, and you own that, you custodize it yourself. But at the same time, um, you know, if you wanted to trade, trade a financial instrument or security, that's backed by gold, you could do that as well. So it's possible, I think, in the future that you could have a dual system where um, you know, cryptos could be custodied at banks, for example, but at the same time, if you really wanted to own your own and be able to transfer them to your friends, et cetera, you could do that. Yeah, I think that we are, I don't have any disagreement with the idea of hybrid system, which is a hybrid decentralized, centralized system, so I think that may be the balance point. Uh, I don't know there's a perfect balance point to this whole thing. If we take a step back and we look at what blockchain and cryptocurrencies are, why they're exciting to a lot of us. One, yeah, we're making money and we have the potential to make money with investments through fixed supply systems. But really, in my view, it's experimentation in a few areas. You're experimenting in, in trust, identity, uh, uh, equitable wealth distribution, and, and society governance. And Every single blockchain that's out there, including the private blockchains that we call them like bank chains and, and things like that, that are, or even the pseudo-centralized DPoS chains that are out there that aren't fully decentralized like Bitcoin or Litecoin or Monero, um, their experimentation into what society as a whole is demanding as a product. I think what we've seen recently over the last few years is that you know, as I'm, I come from the space as a banker, but also as like a liber crypto libertarian. And I, and I personally like the decentralized side, the privacy side of these coins. But what we've seen is that recently investors are tending to invest in a lot of the centralized product projects, and they're demanding services that centralized providers can fulfill. And so I think there's actually a very striated view of what the optimal is. Uh, within blockchain and cryptocurrency? I've got two shots to fire. I think the first shot is really about centralization, which is that I think as we start getting mass adoption, people get dumber and dumber. And so I, I hate to say such a thing because it's very rude, but I think that people are willing to accept uh, custodial exchanges. And the reality is, is if they're willing to accept custodial exchanges, they're basically rebuilding banks. Right, so to me, like if we're that dumb, we don't deserve to have a, is, a is good that, future. Is that dumb? I mean, I have a certificate in cybersecurity. I feel like I'm pretty technically competent that I can store money on a hardware security module somewhere or on a multi, you know, uh, a multi-signature device and understand how to actually spend that when the time comes. Um, for most of the audience, 
I, I would be surprised if you would trust yourself more holding a million dollars on your phone than you would at a bank or custodian. I, I think can I, can we I need, I, um, let, me, let me just retort. Uh, what we, we do need custodial services in order to handle the mass adoption of crypto, but I think today's uh, custodial exchanges are not good custodians, and there's no legal contract, there's no bailment created, so I think that we're foolish to trust entities like those. Well, that, uh, that's because they're unregulated at this moment. And right? they're unregulated, right. that's exactly right. So we have personal experience with this. We started as completely decustodialized, and we got demand from users saying, I want you to hold a small amount of my tokens and, and provide wallet functionality. Um, and we provided that with the warnings that you, there is you know, significant risk. So I, I think that users do have, you know, it's, it's always a, a balance between user experience and sort of safety levels. Um, and I do feel that as long as you do hold um, those, those private keys and as long as you do have money in hot wallets or so connected to the internet, there's a massive honeypot for hackers around the world to strike you. And it's not a question of if they hack you, it's when they hack you. So, so that security risk is, is ever present for any exchange holding um, private keys in hot wallets. I think the, you know, um, the crypto community continually speaks about um, institutional capital coming in. So we're talking about large asset ma global asset managers and getting involved in crypto and putting capital into the space. Um, you know, one thing that we definitely feel in our business is that a lot of these guys are not going to get involved unless there is a custody solution. And that's, totally that includes agree. the insurance aspect of it as well. Absolutely. So I do think that we're in sound agreement about the demand and need for proper, legally defined and insurance-backed custody of crypto assets. So I think that's big. Uh, Franz? Yeah, I just wanted to get back to the innovation part that, that, that was mentioned earlier. I think there is, for me, there's two parts that are very important. So one is the world needs new business models and tokenized ecosystems and ways of incentivizing these central uh, communities is one in which we can do that. I mean. Who would think about a credible traditional way to attack Amazon Web Services for storage? You know, with before Filecoin and, and some of the other projects in the, in the decentralized storage space using crypto economics, it would be very hard to come up with a credible story to do that. So, and so that's, that's one thing that I'm very excited about, and I think it will be interesting to uh, understand how regulations and uh, wanting and, uh, to keep these new business models alive, how that's going to interplay. The second aspect is we need to get more people involved in capital markets. And we've seen some countries expanding their crowdfunding exemptions um, and allowing more people to play. Uh, and I think that's also something that we really need to keep alive and, and that, that I think would be very good for capital okay, markets. Okay, so I'm ready to fight you now. Uh, I absolutely am 100% behind financial inclusion. So I'm excited to have the opportunity to introduce a hundred million new people into crypto through ownership and through wallets and this kind of phenomenon, maybe airdrops, whatever it may be, but let's get them in. Let's get more people in. The thing that I'm scared of is mass investing. I think that there is no wisdom in the crowd. I think the ICO market and the current downturn is basically the direct result of a bunch of people who know not very much investing in whatever is happening at the moment. So I feel like, uh, you know, lots of random people investing in lots of random things is a recipe for disaster. Anyone want to fight? I have, I have personal experience with this. I started an equity crowd investing platform in China, uh, and I was optimistic at first, foolishly so. And then I found out that people just don't have enough time to do the proper due diligence on these companies, That's especially fair. when they're investing a relatively small portion of their money. With a VC, firstly, it's your full-time job. You have enough time to do the due diligence. And secondly, you're putting in enough money where it actually counts. Um, for most individual investors, that's not the case. It's, it's just time prohibitive. Yeah, and I think the emerging phenomenon of signal rounds is actually also dangerous because people aren't reasoning well about following someone and getting different terms. Right, so I think that's a really strange thing that's emerged in the crypto space. Franz, you seem to have something. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with those points, but I also I think that um, uh, there are also examples of crowdfunding platforms that are successful and um, of 
lots of other financing that are not maybe equity based but more debt based that are becoming quite successful globally. So I think you know ultimately the world needs more people to be able to bridge that uh, that gap that is that, that is there currently, and we need to experiment with that and find ways of also getting some of the abuse out of the system because there is a, a manipulation and other things happening in the Mac market. So I want to follow up on that. Like I do think it's important to distinguish between asset classes though because like a debt based or like a peer to uh, P to P, it's a relatively standardized product. Um, so you give a certain amount of uh, interest, and generally, it's, it could be asset backed. Um, with can you, equities, uh, can you can you slow down a little bit? Sorry. Uh, whereas with with a lot of ICOs, they're pre product, meaning they don't even have a product to show you, and so you have to analyze the the ability of the team to execute on the white paper's promises, which is much more difficult relative to, say, an asset-backed debt-related instrument. So I, I would just make that distinction in terms of investing in across different asset classes. So uh, let's get one more comment from uh, yeah, Justin. I was just going to say, I mean, it's, you just have to remember also that we're just so early on in this crypto space right now. That as it develops, there's going to be security tokens. Um, and the other thing as well is that, you know, it's more likely that there will be projects that actually have a user base and a viable product that will be coming to the market to, to issue their own token as opposed to um, you know, a, an idea. Yeah, and I think we all are aware each of projects that have tens, if not hundreds of millions of users that are going to generate crypto wallets. So I think we're, we're in a phase where we're still early, but I do think innovation will happen incredibly fast. So one of the questions that I think is really meaningful would be in the regulatory front. So I'm going to make a statement, and I guess you guys can agree or disagree. Uh, my statement is this, which is that, you know, I believe that securities regulation is important in that the correct regulation and regime will invite in a trillion dollars worth of asset-backed tokens and thus stabilize and grow the crypto economy. However, the topic that is of highest importance is uh, AML and KYC, which means the end of privacy coins. So I think, you know, what I'd like to do, I think I'm probably picking a fight with Brad since he's a crypto libertarian. So I'd, lo I'd like him to re retort right. and right, say, is, is there going to be a privacy coin in the future? Uh, and how will that work without an NSA backdoor? Yeah, I'm a big supporter of, uh, of privacy coins. I think there's a common misperception that you have to tie AML and KYC to the actual underlying blockchain currency and value system itself. I think we've had some hacks recently in the past, especially in Japanese exchanges. There was one pretty big one. Coin check. Yeah, a coin check. I, well, okay, we can name names. And uh, um, the out of out of this discussion, there was uh, the Japanese regulators sort of sort of recommended that the exchanges remove privacy coins from exchange listing. They also strangely took out Augur as well, which doesn't make any sense. But um, that's neither here nor there. Look, the, in my personal view, privacy as a currency is a fundamental right, and it's a system that's needed for us to privacy have a functioning is, economy. Pri privacy is not a fundamental right. I'm sorry, what did you say? Privacy is not a fundamental right. Continue. Oh, I'm saying for a currency. To have a fungible currency, you have to have one that doesn't have taint. Um, this means that the dollars that I give you, if I give you Korean won today, and you can accept it as a merchant, it has no taint because it's, it's an anonymous currency and, and system. If I were to tell you, you can accept my Korean won, but I can trace back every single point for which this Korean won changed hands. And oh, by the way, there's a chance that some of that money came from a drug dealer or a drug transaction. And if you, by accident, accepted this money, you then became a part of the ecosystem that facilitated money laundering, you would then no longer want to accept any Korean won cash. So a non-fungible cash sy currency system, I think, is really, really bad. We can still have decentralized controls over AML and KYC. We can have very strong controls around fiat on-ramps and off-ramps. And I think we need to have this discussion. I, I, I would like to make an additional comment. I think the right kind of regulation is actually necessary for mainstream adoption. In the US, one of the reasons people don't just put their cash under their mattress is be, and put it in banks is because they're FDIC insured, meaning that if the bank loses your money, the government will reimburse you for that. And I'm I think, waiting for you to get back on topic. Hmm? We're talking about KYC. Continue. 
No, I, I ex okay, yeah. So I think regulation, whether it's related to KYC, uh, KYC or otherwise, is, is a necessary step to getting mainstream adoption. Right, and I think we're actually getting into the, the blood feud around privacy coins. So uh, I happen to be uh, not morally in favor or against, but what I am going to predict is I'm going to predict that the governments of the world are going to come out against privacy coins. I think they're going to pressurize exchanges. I think the exchanges are going to delist them, and I think the delistings will, the loss of liquidity will cause a price short circuit to happen in privacy coins. So I think privacy coins, if you're invested in them, I'd get out because I think they're going down. And uh, I, it's not a moralistic statement. I think it's a statement of what I believe regulators will do. That's, that's absolutely possible, what the regulators can do. Uh, we are seeing it in some uh, ignorant jurisdictions. Uh, <laughs> I, but, you know, overall, why did a lot of us get into this space in the beginning? The early crypto guys who got into blockchain to build technology, build networks, we didn't get in it because we wanted to get rich. We, built, we got into the technology early on and started building coin networks because we didn't like the existing system that, that existed today. We saw that monetary policy was a, it was a, had a, it was a faulty system, that the wealth distribution wasn't, wasn't equitable, and that the people at the top were printing money for themselves and the rest of us were getting uh, the short end of the stick, either due to taxes or other mechanisms. So we experimented with different mechanisms of blockchain, cryptocurrency, de decentralization, Bitcoin, proof of work mining, for instance, is, is one of those interesting things. But we came down to, uh, in looking at Bitcoin, we started looking at the assumptions around uh, privacy and we started looking at the assumptions around uh, fungibility of this currency. Um, now, we're, because we have AI data analytics, we have a lot of data itself, we have some endpoints that we're tracking, and we have a lot of taint within the network, in the Bitcoin network, we're realizing there's actually not a very fungible cur currency. And so to, to have Bitcoin a fungible currency, there's a lot of researchers doing, doing quite a bit of res research on zero knowledge proof and other privacy-like technology. Bitcoin is planning on, on adding in privacy tech into their, their blockchain. Ethereum is also adding in ZK Snarks into their blockchain. Um, there's a lot of other privacy coins that are out there looking at fungibility as, a, as an issue. So yeah, it, it may be right in the short term that somebody is gonna ban these currencies. Uh, in the long term though, I feel that um, having the betterment of society, for us to transact in one global economy free of any economic borders and boundaries, right? In one world, we need a fungible currency that works across every single country equally. We can't have judgment as to whether or not this country is bad or not. And, you know, looking at what's happening in the world now, we have, right now, most countries are acting in, in a good way, but we're starting to see dictators emerge in different areas of the world, which are, which are dictating policy to people about who and who they cannot do business with. So, uh, are you talking about Trump? Uh, Trump could be one of those, but we're also seeing this in, in many other jurisdictions. I mean, the extremes ones, right, that you would see are probably in Turkey or Venezuela or some other, other areas like that, right? Sure, but, but Trump and, definitely and, in, and in Venezuela, we're seeing Maduro spec petrol coins, so I think that's an interesting use case. Yeah, I just wanted to, to add to that. I, mean, I think the zero knowledge proofs are something that are uh, hugely important for us as a society. Uh, we've seen with a, a number of different hacks of data and abuse of data by, link, by um, Facebook and by others um, that we need to really think as society about how do we deal with, with all of the data and governments need to know that you are not, acting, not, not a bad actor, but they may not need to know much more beyond that. So I do believe that we as a society and as people in this space have the opportunity to co-shape where it's going and combine both a fungible um, uh, uh, currency with uh, regulation and, and so I don't think those are mutually exclusive. Um, and there is, there is a lot of good projects and a lot of work happening that, that, that can, uh, can help Terrific. us. Terrific. So, uh, you know, panel topic is future of finance. We're six minutes to go. Uh, anyone want to take a bold prediction about the future of finance? Uh, Franz, go ahead and then we can all jump on you. Yeah, my bold prediction is uh, paper share certificates are out and digital I'm share sorry, certificates are I'm sorry, say that slower. Paper share certificates are done and digital tokens are in. That's the future of the capital market. Does that, is that inclusive of cash money? Inclusive of cash money. Okay, cash is gone. Anyone? 8% of all monies 
are actually cash money. And I think, uh, I think what he's saying is it's going to zero. Anyone that's not, that's not true. Go ahead. That's not true. The, it's way less than that. You're talking about printed money, M1 supply. That's what cash I was told. Is, cash is a very, very small percentage of the digital printed money, which happens at the central bank level, right? Through repos. Makes sense, but let's go back to the topic at hand. I think it's fine to challenge I'll take the a stab here. point um, of frame. I think the hybrid model makes sense to me again. The majority of the capital in the world is controlled by um, large asset managers. Uh, if they wanted to be involved in the crypto space, uh, they would likely want to trade it via derivative products, uh, perhaps not even ever owning or physically custodying the underlying. Uh, so a dual system makes sense to me, and I think we need to be more specific on understanding the difference between utility and security tokens to be able to make that distinction going forward. That's great. And uh, I'm going to make another bold prediction, which is uh, sort of public sale, crowdfunded ICOs are largely uh, a thing of the past. Long live venture capital. Anyone want to take a crack? <laughs> I think one part of this, I think venture capital pr does provide more than just money. They provide advice. They provide knowledge. They provide introductions to channels. Uh, sales channels, um, and so I think it is important to realize that you, you get more than just money with, with uh, VC investment. I do both VC investing and ICO crowdfunding. Um, I don't think it's going to go away. The crowdfunding is very popular because VC funding, as it traditionally stands, and you know, getting capital and raising capital um, in, under the traditional methods is regulatory burdensome and very difficult. It also doesn't fit into the new sharing economies of today that we want to bootstrap these networks with a lot of users. Um, crowdfunding in general, starting with rewards-based crowdfunding in the US and in, in Europe, to equity-based crowdfunding with the Jobs Act and some of these other things that are happening, all the way to ICOs today, um, they serve one really, really good purpose. And that's to cross the, the, the chasm for a lot of these tech startups. They innovate, create new technology that's really disruptive, but that they don't have a community to actually use this product. And so commercialization, you have like 90% of these companies failing. With, a, with an ICO, you can crowdfund to a very large community of individuals um, who support your network from day one, and they're voting with their, their money. So you bootstrap, and you you'd kind of jump over this, this chasm and get through, you, you like sort of pre-validate that you can commercialize your product. So I, think I don't think there's validity it's there. I think there's validity there, but I do think there's also a lot of danger there, right? So I think that there will be people that are suckered by marketing and not really able to diligence things properly. So uh, going on to the last little topic I want to say is I'm going to assert that retail banking is due for disruption. There will be an emergent player that's going to bring another 100 million crypto wallets. And I think that that player is not going to be based on fiat banking. It's going to be based on crypto banking, and it's going to be based on mobile wallets. Any challengers? Yeah, I think, I think there's been very little innovation in the retail space uh, over the last 50 years, uh, and it is due for, for disruption. Uh, in the future of finance, I think the key is finding the balance point between decentralized and centralized. That is definitely a perspective. Uh, I, I guess my view is uh, any other kind of cracks at future of finance, uh, any, any hot takes on insurance or any sure. other financial services? I think in, uh, in the short term future, right what we're going to see is a movement of the blockchain and crypto space more towards our legacy financial systems. Right now, we have single unit operator exchanges. That's going to change. We're going to have non-custodial exchanges that are aggregating order books, sharing custody at, at brokers, broker dealers, right? You're going to have uh, a mirrored system to what we have in our existing uh, you know, retail system today. Uh, unfortunately, in certain jurisdictions, the regulators are very har far behind. In Korea, for instance, this is a Korean conference, it's illegal for any of the banks or brokers to deal with cryptocurrency or blockchain-based investments until the Korean regulators can get their heads around the controls that need to be in place and what the laws need to look like, right? So short term, I think we're going to see a mirrored financial system, but just using a lot of blockchain uh, technology in the back end to help facilitate trust. Um, but in the future, way, way out, maybe 10, 20, 30, 50 years out, I believe we're going to move to a fully decentralized uh, uh, infrastructure around payments and, uh, and, and trust networks with smart contracts and things like that.
Fantastic. Last word, Franz. Yeah, and I also think that we will see the value of total derivatives explode because digital shares and digital tokens allow you to be way more creative in how you engineer financial products. And I do see that we will see the value of derivative products increase even further than where it is today. Excellent. And I do think that as we see asset-backed tokens entering into the exchange marketplace, you're going to see an inflow of, of about $10 trillion worth of uh, assets moving into crypto. So I think the overall size of the crypto economy will be much larger. I think that will be much more stable. And I actually think the time horizon uh, that Brad proposed is too long, which is, I think, will be there by five years because I think that we're going to see central banks, not of the strongest countries, of the weaker countries, the central banks will be incorporating crypto assets to further shock absorb and to the further... The weak ones are controlled by the IMF. We tried. Yeah, but the IMF is actually going bullish on crypto. So watch for the IMF to release a cryptocurrency. Thank you very much. <laughs>